In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Well, welcome to our service of the Word for the 14th Sunday after Trinity. I've just come actually from Father Stuart's licensing at St Peter's. I thought I would record this slightly, slightly later than I normally do, just to let you know that it was a beautiful service. Um, there were just a couple of us from All Saints. Charles was able to formally welcome him uh, to his new um, parish and to formally release him from All Saints on behalf of us. So I just wanted to report that back, that um, uh, it was lovely to see Susie and the boys and um, it's a beautiful church and uh, Father Stuart knows that our prayers are with him and um, they'll be back They'll be back soon, back to visit, and whenever, whenever the new normal is, whenever we're able to have parties again, um, uh, they'll come back and have a, a proper um, goodbye plus hugs this time. But um, he goes well, and uh, I know your prayers are with him. So let's begin in our prayer of confession. Turning and returning to the source of all life in our Heavenly Father. Saying together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all e evil. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life everlasting. Amen. We say the Gloria together. If you've got your words with you, if not, pause, but let's try and say the glory, Gloria together. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose only Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence, give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. 
Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began this reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But then that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of our Lord. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amen. I've been thinking this week, the world is obsessed with measuring things. The world seems to naturally equate whatever we can measure as what we can value. If we can measure it, we value it. Any of us, any of you who work in management or in you know, places um, where there's a sort of professional uh, office type culture will know the mantra of needing measurable outcomes. They're results driven. Well, it's interesting, the Christian faith, in contrast, puts value on compassion, forgiveness, kindness, gentleness, fellowship, friendship, hope. Not one of those can be measured. They are immeasurable. In the ancient world, in Jesus' culture, 77 was like saying infinity. It was the biggest number that you could get. Christian forgiveness, forgiveness that comes from the heart, that comes from Jesus Christ, is endless, cannot be measured. Whatever we're given, we're given by God. We freely receive it. And we must freely give it. Of course, this week we are tragically reminded there's a lot of measuring going on. We'll all be measuring the number six, the rule of six. The experts with their data sets and their modeling are looking at the rising numbers of cases. And we're looking at the numbers with a mixture of dread and uncertainty. As a direct or indirect result of the last six months, sadly far too many of us are also measuring and counting the numbers of pennies and pounds left at the end of the month, worried whether we've got enough to pay the rent 
with a mortgage. Measurement is what humans do, it's part of our embodied existence. And there's measurement that is necessary and responsible. It's responsible to be gathering only in groups of six in private settings at the moment. Although, just an aside, worship places are exempt and they are public places and um, uh, they are exempt from that. But there is also measurement go that goes on in human behaviour, which is about controlling and possessing that which is not for us to possess. There's a form of measurement which is an untruth, a denial, an injustice. And I hope you'll understand a little bit more what I mean when I give you a couple of examples. The first is the dilemma of ministry. The church is, for very good reasons, concerned about its own growth. We all know, my God, we know how much the world needs the fellowship and forgiveness and peace of Jesus Christ in our midst. And there is growing pressure on churches, both internally and externally, to prove our growth in numbers. Obviously, with COVID times, that struck a, a new stumbling block. But you'll understand that it has seeped into church culture in some healthy and some unhealthy ways. This sense of the requirement of visible growth by numbers. Of course, there's many, way that many ways that churches grow. Churches grow in faith, the depth of discipleship, which can't be measured easily. Although thriving churches do tend to grow numerically as well. So I'm not, I'm not casting any judgment here. But it's interesting if as priests we are driven entirely by results that can be measured, where do the prayers that we spend time with at the bedside of a dying person stand in those? Or the pastoral prayers or the encounters that we might have with someone in the churchyard who may not have spoken to anyone that day or even that week. Spending time just as a human being, talking to them, acknowledging them. Where would that go if we were only measuring results? Well, it's interesting that one of the most important aspects of priestly ministry is invisible and immeasurable, just like God's love is to us, uniquely immeasurable. The Psalms remind us that God, God's love is like the grains of sand on the shore, like the, the numbers of, of hairs on our head. He loves and knows every cell of our body and our being. Now, the second example that I've got is the one that has had quite an impression on me. Um, for, for some reason, um, it was an encounter I had recently, not this week, um, but I had recently with somebody who um, nobody will, uh, none of you will know. Um, someone that I have known uh, in completely different context and we were just sharing um, you know what you do when you meet someone that you haven't seen for a while and we were talking about how the last six months have been and I just hit this person at the wrong moment they were talking out of tiredness and exhaustion so I do not judge this person in any way but the rule of six had just come out and this person was really exasperated because um, they weren't going to be able to um, do the things that they had been doing. And the gist of what that person said to me was, you know, I'm at this point where the vulnerable people just need to isolate themselves, 
you know, stay out of everybody's way and let the healthy people get on with it and get the jobs and the economy going. Now, as I say, I do report this without judgment and just, you know, hold on to that. I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Because the decisions that the government are making at the moment are complex. We cannot pretend otherwise. There is a real tension between public health concerns and economic concerns. There's no point in saving thousands of lives to go into further restrictions if there are going to be people driven to chronic stress, very serious mental ill health through widespread unemployment or resulting debt problems, saving lives of people with COVID at the expense of losing lives of people whose cancer treatments might be interrupted or whose undiagnosed heart problems fall through the net. These are some terrible ethical choices that the people who are making decisions have to make at this time with their measuring, modelling and data sets. But nevertheless, when this very tired, exasperated person shared this unprocessed thought with me, there was a chill that entered my bones. Because when I heard this person talk in this way, it seemed so profoundly unkind. It seemed to relate to a world vision that saw those other vulnerable people over there and us healthy people over here. Us healthy people who had security and jobs and money and leisure time and activities, meetings and coffee shops or whatever we were doing, which we were neither willing or expected to give up. That what we possessed, the sheer luck of being the age that we are, or the circumstances that we were born into, being the right level of fitness, whatever circumstances, arbitrary circumstances. It was as if this person was saying, well, that those are ours, ours to possess, ours to hold, no matter what. The gospel reading this morning speaks right into that world vision. What we enjoy in this good life is given to us by God alone. The gifts that make me a priest in this very moment preaching to you have been given to me by God. They are not mine to possess or control. They are mine to share. The health that we enjoy, the money we possess, even if we've earned it with the sweat of our brow, is somehow at its heart a gift from God. In the Old Testament, there used to be um, the tradition of the Jubilee year, and it was every seven years. Seven's a very, very important number in uh, Judaism. Every seventh year, there was this sense of the slate being wiped clean. Any debt that had um, accumulated in the, that last seven years would have been wiped clean um, and the economy, the ancient economy, would have re been rebalanced. And it was a profound practical way of the Jewish people remembering that everything that had been given to them had been given to them by God. And we read in the gospel reading, don't we, it's the slaves' actions that are so counter this free giving, this grace, graceful giving of God. We have to be quite careful how we read Matthew's Gospel here. It's not God who is wanting to torture the slave who has tried to hold on and possess that which has been freely given to him. It's the slaves' actions and decisions that have directly led to the consequences that he then must endure. 
And the same, I'm afraid, is true for us as a society today. Our God has made us free and given us responsibility and we participate profoundly in God's love and life. But that means that we treat others as God treats us. And if we don't, then very difficult and tragic consequences ensue. And if as a society we treat the vulnerable, and by the way, we are all vulnerable. The vulnerable aren't over here. We're all vulnerable. We can all be profoundly hurt by others and we can all hurt others. So if we treat the vulnerable as a burden rather than as lives to be treasured and protected, then we only harm ourselves. We harm who we are personally and we harm the very fabric of society. And I've been thinking this week that really what society is crying out for is church. Church, if you notice, Matthew's Gospel has been, has been giving us this real kind of almost guidebook manual about how to run church. And this is another one. It's you have to continue to wipe the slate clean. You treat others as God treats you with grace and gratitude. And the gospel is saying, God help you if you don't. Our Christian faith, Jesus is teaching on forgiveness. They are about measuring the immeasurable. So let us measure out the immeasurable in our lives. Immeasurable doses of kindness and justice and mercy in the days and weeks to come. To all those we encounter, all those we pray for. Because what we've been given has been given freely to us by God. And the immeasurable gifts are called gratitude and grace. And those are the places that if we are living out of grace and gratitude, we are fully alive. So let's hold on to that kindness and gentleness. We are going to need it in immeasurable amounts over the coming days, weeks and months. Amen. So let us profess our shared faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. From the rising of the sun to its setting, let us pray to the Lord. 
Dear Lord, we hold up your church. Let it be a light to the nations at this time. Let us show the world, our families, our parish, our cities, our country, our nations, our world, what true society is, true fellowship. Lord, we pray for all those who are taking difficult decisions within the church and in government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our parish here in Edmonton. We pray for all those struggling with poverty, with food insecurity, with housing insecurity. We pray that you will guide, guide them and give them hope, give them the practical needs give them fellowship and kindness of their fellow human beings at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your world. We pray for all those places torn apart by war, conflict, by natural disaster, by civil unrest, we ask for an outpouring of your peace and reconciliation. We ask for 77 times forgiveness among our fellow brothers and sisters. Lord, we pray for a return to a profound sense of grace and gratitude in our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. We pray particularly at this time for Bridget Fenton, Asitu Kalenga, Doreen the Nick Denim, Emmanuel Tangi, Elaine Malumbi, John Clark, Henriette Kasongo, Vivian Nangongo, Grace Nantongo, Clive Wakeley, Willif Winifred Corpse, Deborah, Michael, Sandy and Stan Cooper, Dares and Lily, Alan Jackson, Lisa Shepherd, Hilda Amadi, Michelle Sands, Tim, Bella Rose, Jean Humphreys, St. Auburn Jordan, Peter and Pam Green and family, Paulette Leslie, Dieter Vec, Sonia Coddington, Isaac Burnett, Beatrice Abwola, Grace Pussard, Benilda Thornhill and Nick Couchman, and all those who are known to us personally, all those who are on our hearts, who we're concerned about. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the recently departed. We pray for the friends and family that are left grieving their loss. In particular, at this time, we pray for those whose funerals are taking place in the coming weeks here, including Leroy McDowell and Ivy Mills, and all those whose anniversaries fall around this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let us remind ourselves just how connected we are and just how much our Heavenly Father loves us with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Just before we have the final blessing and dismissal, just to say apologies, I'm on my own um, uh, this week. Um, Janice was due to join me, but um, I changed the time, so um, it's, that's my fault. As I say, it would be lovely to get a few more people involved in our online worship, and I will, um, I'm playing a bit of August catch-up, so over the coming weeks, hopefully we'll get that arrange do get in touch with me if you'd like to come in um, you know you can come in on your own um, I can arrange to let you in you can do a reading or do the intercessions let me know if you'd like to do that um, we'll be in touch with a number of you I'm sure over the next uh, week or so um, be nice be nice to uh, to so that you're not seeing my face all the time um, also just to say we did say we'd have a Eucharist once a month for this service so that will be next week starting next week so that will be a delight and a joy to share spiritual communion with with um with you um so i'll be blessing and doing the eucharist the eucharistic prayers here and because um the church of england's doctrine says that um we can share spiritual communion as well as physical communion you will be uh receiving the eucharist may not to you feel like like quite um, being at church, but um, hopefully you'll receive a blessing and nourishment from that. So the other final thing to say is if you are not receiving our weekly bulletin, please get in touch. It's really vital that we try and, and keep in contact well over this time. So if you're not receiving it and you're listening to this online, make sure you email me on rev, R -E -V, dot Alison Phillips, all, all together, at gmail.com. Um, that's on the web page as well, on, on the um, home page, um, and the parish mobile as well. So do get in touch. Um, I speak to quite a few of you who are still, um, you know, faithful followers of our online service. So, um, you know, um, thank you for that. Um, I'm glad you're um, sharing our church worship um, at this time. So, um so let's um, let's uh, receive our final blessing. The Lord be with you. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keeps your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord wherever you are. Amen. <laughs>